The Holy Gospel according to Mark. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. Jesus took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Epitha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Greetings to you all. My name is Kathy Martin, and I serve as the assistant to the bishop in the BC Synod, with particular focus in the area of mission renewal and congregational support. I live, work, and worship on the unceded ancestral land of the Semiamu and Coast Salish peoples. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Amen. This summer, the effects of climate change have been ever so visible across our country. Droughts, floods, and fires, just to name a few. I live in the greater Vancouver area, the lower mainland of BC, and we've had high temperatures and a devastating heat dome and heat waves several times over the summer. Sadly, as communities, we've discovered how ill-prepared we are for these extreme weather events. Even as I write, there are scores of wildfires running up and down the mountains of BC's interior regions, forcing the closure of several major highways, displacing people and creatures great and small devastating natural areas as well, those formed and shaped and built by our hands. Fires are inevitable, of course, and necessary. In time, they make way for new growth. They redistribute nutrients moldering on the forest floor, change the profile of the tree canopy so the sunlight can make its way through. The sharp heat cracks open cones freeing the seeds and making the way for a new generation of trees. But first, when these fires appear, random, wild, and out of control, all we see is the devastation and the aftermath of this beloved landscape that is now changed forever. After some time, and often much sooner than we expect, tiny shoots of new life emerge here and there, little 
clumps of green. From a distance, the charred trees remain the most visible feature of the landscape. We have to get closer and look more carefully if we want to see what is emerging out of the ashes. In our gospel reading, an exchange between Jesus and the mother of a young child is like a wildfire. In just a few moments, it changes the landscape of Jesus' ministry. The sharpness of the woman's response cracks open assumptions of the past, releasing seeds that will begin to flourish and make way for a new generation of ministry. Jesus is in the region of Tyre, on the Syrophoenician coast, just a little beyond the borders of Israel. His schedule has been hectic, with very little Sabbath time to catch up with himself, to recharge and to reflect and pray. He's been trying to slip, slip away for a little bit of rest, but everywhere he goes, the crowds follow, or they figure out where he's going and then even arrive there ahead of him. Perhaps that's why he goes into the territory of the Gentiles, to get a little respite from it all, some distance from all these people coming calling. A multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-faith port city like Tyre was just the kind of place that most of his followers would avoid like a plague. It felt like there was something on every corner that would make them unclean. The wrong kind of people, the wrong kind of cloth or animals, the wrong kind of practices. Jesus may have come to this region looking for a little anonymity, but his reputation has gone ahead of him even here. He tucks himself up in a house and makes it clear he doesn't want anyone to know that he's there, but he still can't escape notice. Word of his presence spreads like wildfire, and a mother arrives, prostrates herself at his feet, and begs him to cast the demon out of her little daughter. There's no way to know what this really means. In Jesus' time, all kinds of illnesses were assumed to be caused by evil spirits. We're told this woman is of Syrophoenician heritage. This means that she's a Gentile, not Jewish like Jesus and his followers. Her background, her culture, her religion are all different than his. To us, all these generations later, we think that this is something that wouldn't have mattered to Jesus, would have been something that deterred him from helping someone so desperate for his aid. Her origins or faith background just shouldn't be the deciding factor. But in that moment, for Jesus, it was. Entire surrounded by people he'd been taught to avoid, dismiss, and see as unclean, in his weariness, in his yearning for just a few hours of anonymity, he utters these horrible words to an anguished mother begging for help for her little girl. Let the children be fed first, for it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. What? What did he say? Are you kidding me? His response is outrageous, at least to us. Yet to the people of his day, to the Gentiles hearing this story, Jesus' comment wouldn't even have raised an eyebrow. To them it was a completely appropriate and reasonable response, no matter how we might struggle with it now. I read somewhere that the most dangerous prejudices are the ones that are unacknowledged, the ones that we don't realize we have. If we can't see them, we can't change them. We are all shaped by the mindset of the world that we grow up with, whether we are aware of it or not, whether we like it or not. This is true, even for Jesus. 
Yet this woman, this mother, doesn't back down. In her desperation, she sees and challenges his cultural and religious bias. Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. She contends that there is a deeper truth about God that his past is obscuring, and she challenges his refusal to help. Her words burn, and in the sharpness of her response, Jesus realizes that his call goes far beyond the people that he has been calling his own. In that moment, a new generation of ministry begins to take root, one that will flourish over the centuries and extend to the ends of the earth, a ministry that will welcome all people, include all people, and open the door to all people to enter into the love and grace of God. I wonder who you might encounter if you risked venturing into places in your neighborhood or community that you normally would avoid. I wonder if you might find someone who would interrupt your thinking the way the woman did when she encountered Jesus. I wonder who might cause us as a church to reevaluate our living our prejudices, our assumptions about the way the world works or ought to. Maybe we would discover that there are things that need to change in our life together as the ELCIC, as synods, as this Lutheran expression of the church in Canada. The way that they did for Jesus when he started really listening to this Syrophoenician woman. Over and over, God's call to us includes learning, having our assumptions challenged and our ears open to God's grace. It means letting go of cultural privileges and stereotypes, embracing insiders and outsiders, and giving up the idea that there isn't enough grace to go around. For these tiny morsels, the smallest crumbs from the table, are precious gifts and a feast beyond our wildest imagining. Thanks be to God. Amen.